That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That's a good step. Yep. Not a three footer. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you we say we have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. One of truth's protective layers. You are about to embark on a one-way journey to the greatest lie ever told. The launch pad for our expedition is the site of a Cold War era nuclear missile base that was covertly hidden beneath the ground in Old Bridge, New Jersey. Underground silos stored the Nike Hercules nuclear warhead, and the residents of this sleepy town had no idea it was even there, for this was an age of great secrets. phenomenon now called colored banding and I've taken this all from Apollo 16 footage. You can see that every time something goes by the camera lens quickly with any pace to it, it gets this colored banding on it and that goes for shadows as well. I'm going to slow it down here so you can see when the shadow is created the colored banding happens and that's a freeze frame of the color banding around the shadow. This is Station 2, Apollo 16, and just get a perspective for how far the astronaut on the right is. And the camera we're watching this through is the color TV camera on the rover, which is controlled from Houston. And note the light source and the visor of the astronaut walking by. And now, we're going to cut a little further in this clip. Pay attention to what happens. It's just a very impressive sight as far as the boulder goes. They're all angular. It's just a very impressive sight as far as the boulder goes. They're all angular. What you're looking at are shadows covering the entire location out to the horizon. I'm showing you the same clip. And there are two shadows. One, two. That is impossible with the sun as the light source. The only way this could be possible is if it's an artificial light source, because there's nothing tall enough there to block out that much space. And I showed you how far the astronaut is from the rover. And these shadows are covering the entire location. And this is black and white normal speed. See his backpack, light, shadow. Okay, now let's take one black and white, slow down. Also note that the image is shaking because the other astronaut is at the rover. It's as if something has fallen across the light source, causing fast moving shadows. The banding reads on the back of the astronaut's backpack, but it doesn't read in the black zone because the lens only puts banding on things it can read and it can't read a shadow in the darkness. If the light source is the sun, how do you block out the sun with two guys on the moon? <laughs> How do you block it out? You can't block out the sun for that long of a shadow. Astronaut Charlie Duke is out there in the distance. Astronaut John Young is back by the rover. So who's causing the shadows?
This is a diagram of the Mesa table, which sits on the lunar surface in front of the lunar module. At the bottom, that rectangular bag is called the equipment transfer bag, and that is the thing we are going to be paying attention to in this clip. Now, on the right, you'll see the other astronaut, and he's moving away from the ship, and he's fooling around with the UV camera. The astronaut in front of you is about to turn and go back towards the Mesa table and the equipment transfer bag, and when he does, on the right, you'll see the equipment transfer bag swinging. It's just swinging back and forth, and it's going at about the same pace. It shows no sign of the momentum slowing down. It's just going back and forth as if some sort of vent is blowing on it, but there's nothing that can be blowing on it if that's the moon. Because on the moon, there is no atmosphere, there's no wind, there's no air, there's no breeze that can be blowing that. This clip is from the closeout of EVA-1, Apollo 16, and the next clip is from the closeout of EVA-3, also Apollo 16. And we're going to see the same phenomenon with the equipment transfer bag. As soon as astronaut Charlie Duke attaches it to the Mesa table, it starts swinging on its own again, as if it was being installed right over a vent. But then it gets really interesting because I think they notice it and they discuss it and then take corrective actions. Now you're going to see Charlie Duke take corrective action. He's going to walk over to the swinging ETB bag. He's going to remove the camera that's attached to his chest. He's going to put it on top of the Mesa table. And then he's going to put his camera in the ETB bag. And then he's going to remove the bag from the straps. And he's going to place it on top of the Mesa table so it's no longer swinging from the straps. And there's obviously a voice we can hear organizing the charade-like diversion you are about to see. Where's the uh, bag that the, that the, uh, the good old uh, UV... Hey, Charlie, did you throw my camera away? No, I didn't throw your camera away. Where is it? Over there? Yeah. Okay. <sighs> the bag that the... what? The bag that the what? He's obviously hearing a voice we can't hear who's telling him what to do. This is just a really strange scene. Now watch as he walks away. You'll see he no longer has the camera. You can't have any wind or breeze or ventilation on the moon. But this thing is like a perpetual motion machine. And this is how they corrected that motion, by taking it off the straps and putting it on top of the table. Okay, now let's go back to the first clip from EVA-1 again, and you see the bag swinging on the right. I'm revisiting this, not so much to look at the bag, but that strap in the right hand corner that hangs down from the ship. Keep your eyes on that strap because it's about to get hit by an object. What are we going to do with this thing? Can we throw it away? Uh, leave it on it. Throw it away. It's empty. Pull it straight up. There you go. That crummy thing. Well, no, that's okay. So the strap was hit with momentum, but it exhausts the momentum and it slows down and it practically comes to a complete pause. And that's the reason I'm showing you this, to illustrate the fact that 
You can see momentum acting naturally in this clip. Let's take another look at it. But notice how that strap responds to gravity and responds to the momentum dissipating, whereas the ETB bag does not. It goes at a steady pace throughout both clips from EVA1 and EVA3. The logical question that comes to mind is whether some mechanism on the ship, some motorized mechanism, vibration, or exhaust is somehow blowing the bag, and the answer is no. The bag hangs from the Mesa table. The Mesa table is simply a table that holds supplies and equipment for the extravehicular activity. The bag, as you can see, just hangs down from the table. And as we take a look at the Apollo 16 summary at nasa.gov, Quote, because the LM had remained in lunar orbit six hours longer than planned, the LM was powered down to conserve electrical power. So that rules out the possibility that the bag is swinging from any kind of vibration caused from the power of the ship. Everything they put in the ETB is supposed to go back to the ship for transfer to Earth. And the 70 millimeter Hasselblad camera is not on that list. Furthermore, it is common knowledge also listed in the lunar surface procedures that the 70 millimeter Hasselblad cameras were left on the moon. Charlie Duke was responsible for attaching the ETB by the straps to the SRC table at the Mesa. It specifically says the ETB is supposed to hang from that table. Charlie Duke is not supposed to touch that bag again or have anything to do with it for the rest of the mission until they are back in the lunar module. John Young has the responsibility of taking that thing off the straps and attaching it to the conveyor when he is entering the lunar module and then the procedure calls for Charlie Duke to unhook it at that point. Hey Charlie, did you throw my camera away? No, I didn't throw your camera away. Where is it? Over there? Yeah. <sighs> the bag that they what? What's going on right now with him removing the bag and then putting it on top of the table is a total break with protocol, and any break with protocol is by definition a contingency plan. And that's why Charlie Duke and John Young seem so confused in this scene. We got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six Hasselblad, uh, three DAX. Uh, SWC and a CRE, the maps, various other things. Various other things. The problem with various other things is that various other things are not listed on the lunar surface procedures. Various other things directly refers to the camera, which he just stuffed in the ETB. Okay, let me drive this up the hill. Okay. This, this is a lie. looking at a series of photos taken from EVA 3 of Apollo 16. Every photo in this magazine is completely ruined by these smudges you see. At the bottom of the images, the number 39, that identifies the camera these were taken with. There were two cameras used for 70 millimeter shots during Apollo 16, number 39 and number 33. Those numbers are etched on the resu plate, which is a glass plate that faces the film. It's in between the lens and the film, and it has these crosshairs on it, and it also has the identification number on the bottom of the resu plate. All of the damaged photographs were taken with number 39. 162 photos 
on magazine 116B, and there are some other damaged photographs with this exact same pattern on magazine 114B. So you've been looking at the cover of the Apollo 16 technical debrief document, and I want to draw your attention to the commentary on this issue. Quote, the cameras worked nominally, even though we got them real dusty, and it was hard to see the setting after the EVAs. We wiped them down with a wet cloth inside and changed the film outside. Not only that, I guess according to the photo guys, we got some dust inside on the resu. The camera still worked, although it left a couple or three streaks across the film. Notice what John Young says about the photo guys. This raises an important point. We'll digress for a second to discuss one of the main defenses that people make to show or argue that we had to have gone to the moon. And they often say that there would have been so many people involved in the conspiracy it would have been impossible to keep it quiet. The only people who would have known about the hoax would have been those on a need-to-know basis, and that would have been very few people. You have your astronauts, you have the people filming everything and building the locations, and you have the people authorizing it, and that's it. Everybody else would have been doing their one task in the line and sequence of events that they were responsible for. And this segues into another defense made by people who believe we went to the moon, and that is, why didn't NASA have them do things over after they made mistakes? And the reason for that is that this was live, and not everybody was in on it. And those hundreds of people you see at Mission Control, they're not in on it. You got the surgeons, they're monitoring the heart rate. You have the data guys, they're monitoring whatever is coming in on their feed. And everybody is looking at a live event and all over the world people are monitoring a live event. So there were no do-overs. Going back to what John Young said, by way of illustration about the photo guys, the photo guys would have received the film. The film couldn't be developed on the moon, it had a chain of custody. That had to take place, and those guys were not in on it. Now this is the cover of Apollo 16 mission report and let's go to the equipment section paragraph D the resu plate on the lunar module pilot 70 millimeter electric data camera was smeared during a magazine change between extra vehicular activities two and three Charlie Duke indicates that they wiped the resu plates down with a wet cloth inside the cabin in between the EVAs when they were done with their work on the moon, they would go back into the lunar module, seal the hatch, repressurize the cabin, and camp out for the night until the next day when they would continue the mission on the second EVA and then the third EVA. Now let's take a look at the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal and they are taking their cue from the debrief and from the mission report. In the brackets, their explanation states each frame on magazine 116E shows a set of smudges. Detail of the smudge pattern change only slowly from the beginning of the magazine to the end. The smudges are undoubtedly the result of contact of a dust-laden, damp cloth with the resout plate in John's camera. So NASA, the astronauts, and the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal all march in lockstep alleging that the stain happened inside the cabin in between EVA 2 and 3. This is because the surface of the moon is a near vacuum and all moisture and liquid would boil immediately in the vacuum of space. And indeed, this entire story is a complete fiction. It's a fraud and it's a lie and NASA knows 
absolutely with 100% certainty exactly when that smudging happened and it did not happen in between EVA2 and EVA3 inside the cabin of the lunar module. It did not happen then. Furthermore, the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal is absolutely wrong in its assertion that this smudging happened as the result of contact with a damp, dust-laden cloth. And what you see is the familiar splash pattern of a spill. Something was spilled on the camera. This is a picture of the index for Apollo 16 from the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal at nasa.gov. And when you come to Geology Station 8, you'll see below that Traverse to Station 9. And instead of Geology Station 9, it says the Great Sneak. And when you click the Great Sneak, it brings you to Geology Station 9. And this is where the magazine change happens. Did he say both change? Yeah. Okay. Tony, I don't have a black and white left. I'm going to run off a couple, John. Here are the final three shots taken with 107C directly at Station 9 during EVA 2, and these are not marked by the smudges. Concluding that magazine at Station 9, none of them are marked by the smudges. They are absolutely perfect. you are looking at now was the very last picture taken before that magazine change at station 9 where they are now. This is 107-17583 and as you can see there are no smudges on it. The very next picture taken with that camera is after the swap of magazines and this is now 114-18444 and that photo was on magazine 114B. On the left, we have 18444, the very first image taken with the smudges. And you can see the pattern is clear, the dust has not grabbed to it yet. On the right is 18577, and this one was taken the next day during EVA 3. Compare the two stains. The streaks are the same. These are the same exact patterns. The orange juice dried, and it's stained in the same way. The streaks match. See the first long streak on the left, and then look to the right image, and that same long streak is there, and it becomes obvious that this is a spill pattern of orange juice spilled on the glass that persisted over two days. Every single photograph taken with camera 39 up until this moment at station 9 during EVA 2 was absolutely perfect, and every single photograph taken with that camera from this moment on will be absolutely smudged. If the astronauts had wiped the cameras down with a damp cloth inside the cabin later that evening, we would not see the stain pattern the next day during EVA 3. And this is the moment that it happens. John Young drops his sample bags and Charlie Duke comes over to help him reattach them to his camera and John Young asks Charlie Duke to check his lens and since we know that the very next picture snapped with that camera will have the familiar stain pattern on it, John Young's concern with his lens leads us to another possibility that the stain pattern is on the lens and not the res out plate. Thing is peel off. Oh, the 
So what has just happened to cause this stain pattern to emerge? The answer is orange juice. It has been well documented that the astronauts had a problem with the suction straws inside their helmets that allowed them to take sips of orange juice. The straws would accidentally squirt orange juice all over them and into their helmets and this was a big problem on the mission and the orange juice actually seeped into the neck ring. And it appears obvious now that the orange juice leaked through the neck ring at station 9 and caused the camera to be stained. And that is direct evidence that they could not possibly be on the moon because if orange juice could leak through the helmet lock, then the helmet lock was not properly sealed to protect the astronauts from the vacuum of space. And this is because the helmet and the neck ring, in order to be airtight, must also have been watertight because water molecules are bigger than air molecules. So if water escaped, then oxygen also escaped and the suit would not have been pressurized and in that case, the astronauts would be dead. To better understand the purpose of a lunar spacesuit, let's let our friend and the astronaut demonstrate the hazards lunar explorers will encounter. If Andy were to step out on the surface of the moon without a spacesuit, this is what would happen. In the near vacuum of space, the gases within his body would immediately expand. His blood would appear to boil from the rapid expansion of gases coming out of solution in his bloodstream. And he would soon feel the effects of another condition of space, lack of oxygen. After 20 seconds in a vacuum and without oxygen, Andy would be trading in his astronaut wings for a more permanent variety. Okay, now let's go back to the Apollo 16 technical air-to-ground voice transcription. Charlie Duke says, Okay, Houston, do you read us? Over. Yeah, we read you fine, Charlie. And then Charlie Duke says, Okay, we had one heck of a time getting our helmets off. It turns out that this orange juice is the best cement you've ever seen. It seeped down in between the seals and the helmet and the ring, and we couldn't get the thing unlocked without a great effort. Christmas, 1968, when man first cut the silver cord of Earth's gravity to orbit the moon. In the year 1675, Sir Isaac Newton was asked by his fellow scientist, Robert Hooke, how he had accomplished so much. If I have seen further, Newton wrote, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. First stage of propellant tanks have been pressurized. The engines will build up to a thrust of 7.6 million pounds. T minus 30 seconds. We have a cutoff. Have... May 18th, 1969. We were almost ready. Man had orbited the moon once. Man had test flown the lunar module, the lunar landing craft, in Earth orbit, once. But before we would commit men to a lunar landing, there were still a number of things to be worked out. This was the mission of Apollo 10. In the words of its commander, Tom Stafford, 
to sort out all the unknowns and pave the way for a lunar landing. In the first three segments, I'm quite certain about the conclusions that have been drawn, and we will return to the heavy artillery in the final segment. But for this segment, I want to sort out a few unknowns. And these are pieces of information that I've discovered which are of peculiar interest to the entire Moon Hoax culture. Now, I am not the first to suggest there's some sort of Geppetto character in the rafters above pulling the astronauts by some sort of harness with fishing wire. Like, why does Charlie Dude want John Young to push on his head here? Ah, oh, here I go again. Give me a help. There you go. Okay, just push, start pushing on my head. Here we go. Okay, here we go. So he pushes down on his head and his feet seem to levitate backwards. Our next speaker is Professor James McKinney. If you double the size of your rocket, you don't double the size of your payload. So you're very limited. And now let's try and get to the next planet or out to the moon. We have to start sending individual things up there, couple them together, and then go out to these other planets. Uh, by the way, there's a small problem with going to the moon and inch by inch, NASA is leaking out that they know that there's a problem there. It's called the Van Allen belts, high radiation belts of charged particles around Earth, and we don't know how to get through them, they say. Well, isn't that interesting because there sure didn't seem to be a problem back in 1969. Obviously, they didn't go to the moon. The United States did not go to the moon. The Russians knew it all along. Uh, I thought at the time we did, but I've since learned we absolutely did not. And there's no question about it. And they're starting to figure it out. NASA has a program called Living with a Star. That's a pretty name for how do we get through the Van Allen belts. They have all their top scientists working on it. It's a tremendous problem because we do not have any kind of a spacecraft that we can send up that doesn't have metal in it. And when these charged particles hit metal, they produce x-rays. Nothing you can do to get around that. So anybody sitting around something metal in outer space in the Van Allen belts is going to be French fried. And so that whole thing was a giant hoax. And you have second and third tier scientists in the United States who are running around saying, oh yes we did, yes we did. But the very top level people, what I call the tier one scientists, the black op mill scientists, know for a fact we didn't go. And it's a real problem. They don't know how to get through there. This picture is with the new Hubble camera and it shows that in fact if you take this angular distance out to Pluto and you translate it into the surface of the moon we can in fact resolve the landing sites the alleged lunar landing sites and the way you would do this is you take the pictures at dusk when the shadows became very long and it would be a very hard thing for them to fake so at any rate we have telescopes on Earth that are much larger than the Hubble. Much better resolving power. So why, you would think these astronomers would be chomping at the bit to show you those lunar landing sites. And look at the incredible resolving power of this telescope we have here. Why have none of them done that? Because there ain't nothing there. And we get all kinds of excuses. Oh, we can't turn the telescope up there because the moon's too bright. Well, then all of a sudden we saw the full moon on a web page, on a NASA web page, the entire full moon taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you're telling me they can't take one little teeny patch of the moon, which is millions of times less bright. So 
Bottom line is, they know they didn't go. Join us now on a quest for the truth to the moon. In this film, we shall not only prove beyond all reasonable doubt that many of the official NASA images of lunar exploration are fake, but we shall also examine the motives for the biggest lie put before the world. Why did NASA repeatedly fake lunar images and photographs? Why did NASA stage lunar expeditions which did not happen? The answer will surprise you. NASA spent gigantic sums of money during the 1960s, but most of it was spent on the ground, not in space. Huge American corporations, many of which were manufacturing hardware for the military, made gigantic profits designing space vehicles and more importantly, life-sized models of spaceships and even huge stage sets resembling the lunar surface. Someone in NASA had realized that after taking billions of dollars from the American people, if they couldn't make it to the moon, they would fake it to the moon. Obviously, if you're going to somewhere that nobody has been before, you need to have a simulator which recreates that environment as closely as you can. If you're going to the moon, you recreate the surface of the moon. And here we see a section of the lunar surface created. It's about 30 foot high, 30 foot long, 35 foot long scale is given by the two people standing in front of me. There were plenty of simulation exercises, but the point is, and this is, should be taken into account in virtually everything that is discussed with the Apollo program, 400,000 people may have worked on the program in total, but none of them had a need to know more than his own job required. The people who were making the rockets didn't know what the people who were making the spacesuits were doing because they had no need to know about that. Their job was to make the best models and the best uh, simulation of the lunar surface that they could. And if we come up to this picture here, we see the three scales on which these models were built. We have here the whole moon as one unit. It stands about 20 foot high. We have here behind it a section of the surface of the moon. You'll notice it's curved. And here we have a more detailed section of the lunar surface. What you're saying is that the images which we're told show a camera pointing out the window of the lunar module as it's coming into land on the moon could well have been filmed previously using these large-scale models. That's right. It could well be that what we are looking at are films of realistic models. We have no means of knowing if they were actually taken on the lunar surface or whether what we're watching is part of the simulation exercise and the training exercise. And you'll notice here on these models there is a camera track. A camera starting at this end coming down here would approach the moon or appear to approach the moon and become ever closer towards it. This is a simulation rig that was built. Uh, this is the command and service module of the Apollo program. And you'll notice that the window here looks out onto a block here. And there's another one here. They're curved. These are the screens onto which the lunar surface was projected as the craft made a simulated approach towards the lunar surface. Is what we're seeing a mixture of fact and fiction. It is fact. It is fiction. It's mixed together. It's hard to separate them until you examine it closely. If a spacecraft is in deep space, the only possible explanation for a light seen through the window of the spacecraft is the sun. It's the only bright light in space. 
If it's not the sun, then it has to be some other artificial light, which implies that that particular image is possibly fiction. July 1961. NASA was soon being criticized for the flimsy construction of their hardware. The first orbital capsules did not even have windows in them for the astronauts to look out of. One of the most vocal critics was one of NASA's most respected astronauts, an all-American hero named Virgil Gus Grissom, who almost drowned when recovery helicopters were unable to lift his space capsule from the sea. After a successful journey into space, Gus Grissom almost died through NASA's bad planning. Or was this an early attempt to silence Gus Grissom? May 1963. Astronaut Gordon Cooper experiences re-entry problems in his Faith 7 rocket ship. The prototype lunar module, known as the LIM, had serious stability problems. At this stage, there was no guarantee that even if NASA managed to get a spaceship orbiting the moon, they could land safely without killing the crew. footage which we see of the limb approaching the moon be filmed in a TV studio? It was filmed in a TV studio. There's absolutely no doubts whatsoever about that. And the way that this film was created was by the use of models. There's nothing secret about the models. They exist. You can go and see them today. The models were very lifelike, very realistic. There is one that is a life-size model. It's in Flagstaff in Arizona. It's two miles long and it's an exact replica of the Sea of Tranquility. The photographs were used to create from those images the replica of the Sea of Tranquility so that if it was flown over in a helicopter it would appear as if it was a spacecraft approaching a similar area to land. So yes, all the scenes of the lunar surface were filmed on Earth. radiation and without having spacesuits nor spacecraft which can protect the occupants from radiation NASA convinced the American people to pay 40 billion dollars for the space program the most lethal forms of radiation of course are at the higher end of the spectrum that's gamma rays and x-rays uh, we know what ultraviolet can do. If you stay out too long in the sun, you get sunburn and skin cancer and die, and it's all very sad. But gamma rays, and x-rays especially, are particularly lethal to humans, unprotected humans. There was no protection that I have been able to identify. I've been found no reference to it. I found nothing that will tell me what level of protection is offered. So I have to assume none was. I've contacted the manufacturers of the spacesuits and they said there was no radiation protection built into the spacesuits because I asked them if these same spacesuits could be used by technicians to go to Chernobyl or Three Mile Island because the nuclear reactors produce the same radiation as produced in space. They said no, not advisable, no protection. James Van Allen grew up in the small Iowa town of Mount Pleasant during the 1920s. He was an exceptional student, 
became class valedictorian, and exhibited an intense vision that even then looked beyond our planet. The environment was the time of the Cold War, and it was this something scary. It was something for a child that seemed very scary to have to talk, hear about bomb shelters and hiding under our desks. And I remember first hearing that my father was going to go to Russia and being fright, so frightened by that and asking my father, what, why was he going to Russia? Wasn't he scared? And I remember him explaining to me that in the scientific community, what they do and as they take data and exchange data, somehow that transcends what is going on in the political arena. So that there is always a sense that the uh, quest for intellectual activity ha was something very special. The media focused on the Explorer 1 achievement as, at last, legitimizing the U.S. as a worthy adversary to confront the communist Sputniks. The public seemed captivated with the propaganda created by this new space race. Dr. Van Allen and his students, however, chose to focus on the data that was returning from their scientific instrument inside Explorer 1. When the first results came back, the, the group at the University of Iowa, this was uh, Van Allen and Ernie Ray then began to help with it, eventually Carl McElwain, uh, saw immediately that there was an anomaly, there was something unexpected. We have encountered a very great in increase in radiation intensity, which is vastly beyond what could be due to cosmic rays alone. We call it geomagnetically trapped radiation. And I gave an explanation of what, uh, my interpretation at a press conference following the uh, scientific session. And one of the reporters uh, says, uh, stood up and he was trying to visualize what I was saying. And he said, you mean it encircles the earth like a belt? I said, yes, that's great. That's, uh, that's what it is. It's like a belt around the earth. And so that's the way they got the name of Radiation Belt from this exchange of this uh, newspaper reporter and myself. Well, certainly the uh, discovery of the radiation belts uh, was the most uh, important discovery of the International Geophysical Year because it represented a discovery of some major phenomenon that had a, a substantial impact both on scientific research and on plans for manned flight later on. In late 1958 and early 1959, Van Allen flew instruments on Pioneers 3 and 4. Both were unsuccessful attempts to hit the moon, but their flights provided the Iowa group with essential confirming data. Pioneer 3 documented the existence of a second radiation belt, and Pioneer 4 became the first U.S. spacecraft to orbit the sun. Any ill effects from the Van Allen radiation belts? No, now I'm not sure we went far enough out to, to encounter the Van Allen radiation belt. Maybe we did. I'm not a chemist, I'm not a geologist or an anthropologist. I'm a, uh, an, a retired electrical engineer. I've worked at NASA Goddard for over 20 years. Uh, I'm retired now and I have uh, worked with image processing, which is a uh, similar to some of the uh, things that are done on computers today. However, at the time that I made my, I did my work, uh, the, the computers that are so well established today were not available. Yeah, hello, I like your presentation uh, very, uh, very much, but uh, I got a couple of questions here. First one is, what, if any, are the differences between you and uh, Richard Hoagland concerning the politics on the cover-up? And part two is, uh, what's the difference between you and Mr. Hoagland concerning the scientific implications of the face, especially since uh, Richard Hoagland kind of brings in hyperdimensional physics into the picture of, of the face on Mars? Thank you. Okay. Um, the one thing I'd like to clarify, I should have done at the beginning, um, Richard Hoagland and myself are like oil and water. Uh, the second thing is that, um, and I'll go into the third thing, is that uh, Richard comes up with ideas where he does not have groundwork or supporting evidence 
not even evidence, not, and certainly not proof that things exist where they don't. For instance, I've seen some of his work where he has found swastikas and German tanks on Mars, <laughs> and he has found cathedrals on the moon Europa of Jupiter that resemble burnt out cathedrals from World War II in uh, Europe, and various other things which not only can't be proved, but they aren't even evidence, and I stay as far away from him as I can. And I, there was a, the last part of your question concerned, I, I forget exactly. Yes, uh, uh, he always talks about hyperdimensional physics, okay. and he comes up with all these formulas on, on the dimensions of, of the, also the pyramid on Mars, you know, and, and all these, you know, he, uh, you know, in his book he has all these uh, geometric configurations, and he tries to bring in hyperdimensional physics. It's hard enough for me to give evidence and present it at conferences with facts that I can show to scientists. But to, to try to back up something with a relationship to another planet is so hypothetical that it, has, it just doesn't have the substance to hold up. Most scientists would classify that under the term of numerology and not have anything to do with it.